I'm here in the powder room of Battleship Texas, underneath turrets one and two. I'm here with Don, who's going to give us an amazing tour about how the massive guns were serviced, both with powder and shell. I'm Trevzor, and this is Talking Ship. We're in the powder room, and this is probably one of the biggest spaces I've been in in Battleship Texas so far. Uh, tell me a little bit about this room and how we're going to get these 105 pound bags of powder from here into the guns so that we can put shells on targets. Sure. And is the, uh, the answer to most questions about the Battleship Texas in that period is the answer is 19 year old sailors. <laughs> uh, this is, as you can see, no monorails in this room at all. Everything is manpower um, driven. Okay. Uh, down here in the main magazines. The uh, powder is stored, as you can see, in uh, two powder bags per can. There would be a row of powder here, a walkway, powder, powder, walkway, powder, stacked up to our height, uh, and with enough powder and projectiles on board to fire these main guns about 1,200 times. Wow, that's impressive. It's a lot of shells downrange. It is definitely a lot of shells downrange. Now, if we were going to be performing target practice or going to general quarters during uh, combat in, say, World War II, we would have a line of sailors uh, walking into this room down these aisleways and pulling a bag of powder out and actually physically walking them out. Okay, so if, if I'm getting powder out of this room into these, these guns, I'm going to grab one of these heavy bags, yes. potentially half my weight or more, and I'm going to walk, what, out the store this way? You are. All right, so we're going to go this way. And it's going to come along this area. And uh, you told me about this. Uh, you said it was a scuttle. What yep. is this and why does this exist? Like, this seems like an extra step. It is an extra step, but it's a very important safety step. Uh, normally, these doors, which are open right now, would be closed. Okay. Uh, you would use these scuttles, which you can see are sealed from either side, that as you flip it, uh, it will only open to one side or the other. Okay. So if we're in combat and there is a flash, a strike on the, uh, the turret, for example, sure. to ensure that that flash does not come down and enter into the powder room and have a chance for it to explode and blow Detonate the Detonate the whole up, ship. There are barriers okay. in between. That seems like really smart design. So you have what would potentially be a line of people pulling powder out to here, throwing it on this cradle, maneuvering it through this basically the storeway uh through this this bulkhead and we're going to be a, what underneath main turret one through here we are okay so a little a little less claustrophobic but still so the other side of the scuttle is here the other side of the scuttle is here there would be about 19 or so sailors in this compartment ready to receive either shells or powder and be able to start sending them on their way up to the turret okay um we have a little device here on the bulkhead which says Send powder. Okay. And so now a powder bag will be placed into the scuttle and a sailor stationed here. We'll simply open it from this side and the powder bag rolls right out. Amazing. I'm, I'm going to take a quick moment to pause here and say the action on that was really good for how old I know Texas is. <laughs> like that was really smooth. There was no creaking or anything. I was very impressed. So you've got a bag of powder. It's being handed somewhere, I'm sure. Where does the powder go next? The powder will now go to the powder hoist. Okay. Um, but to begin that, we need to take a look at this uh, piece of equipment right here. All right. You notice that we're bolted to the deck right here and along a center line, but there's nothing else touching the deck. Yes. So as the turret rotates left or right up on the main deck, this entire mechanism rotates with it. That sounds dangerous. So. Our hoists are going to be in various locations. Great. So the answer to that is everything is done clockwise, almost like a ballet, okay. in order for us to get what we need to the right place. Fantastic. So in this case, for the powder bag, one of these sailors will simply grab that powder bag okay. and walk it to the powder hoist, which in this case is all the way to the front. OK. So we're going around this way. And at this point, there is a conveyor inside the hoistway. Sure. And we just simply put it on the next platform on the conveyor, and up it goes. Wow. So let's, let's just say that the turret is traversed 90 degrees off, off mm -hmm. of the starboard bow. 
that sailor still has to walk all the way around. Has to walk all the way around to this location right over. That's here. rough. That's, that is rough. That's pretty rough, but I, I guess it's better if it's rotated the other way. It kind of sucks to be the other guy. Well, yeah. I, that depends on who you're friends with, I the, suppose. That's fair. That's fair. So we've got the powder in here. This is being moved up. Uh, we heard earlier from Keith that it is then, like, muscled up by other other sailors into the actual turret. It is, and uh, I don't know if Keith had mentioned, uh, rather than going strictly into the turret itself, it stops one level below. Yes. And at that point... Uh, the sailors can move powder bags left and right to make sure there are four on either side. So each one of the guns has four powder bags which, with which to uh, discharge uh, that shell. Fantastic. So that's half of the equation, the explosive half. But there's the other explosive half, the yes. shells. How do those function? How do we get those into these, these rifles? That's just as easy. You say easy, and it sounds <laughs> like it's not easy. Now we're on the port side shell room for turret number one. As you can see, we have a number of shells here stored in their racks. And also you notice that they are stored with the pointy end down as opposed to on the flat. That, that kind of seems dangerous. Um, the Texas and New York did that throughout their service life. And one can only suppose that the naval constructors thought that this would be a faster way of serving the guns. Whether it was or not, we do know the Navy went back to the other <laughs> <laughs> fashion and storing shells on the flat bay. Sounds smart. Uh, while we're in storage racks right here, you would see that we do have the monorails above each one of these rows. Yes, we do. There would be a chain hoist just like this one on each of these rows. And in order to bring these shells out, we would have to pick it up with that chain hoist and then pull it this direction. Wow. In order to do that, we need to hang on to something. And there would be what are called pad eyes. Two of these pad eyes installed in the base of the shell. Wow. Uh, they're threaded and they would be locked in place. All right, cool. So now we can lift the shell and pull it out to this pathway. That's that's impressive. Now, I know it has more steps to go, but these shells, we were told, is somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 pounds. That's as much as my Ford Focus at home. <laughs> You're moving one of these a pretty good distance, especially later in, in the battle. Yes. Like, that's got to take an impressive amount of manpower in and of itself. It is, and that is really the name of the game. This is a ship that was designed and created in the first decade of the 20th century. So it's not automated as we're used to seeing in sure. the modern Navy. So things were very much manpower intensive back then. And that's why each one of these turret systems um, employed over 70 crew members yeah. just to handle those guns. That, that's impressive. So we've got, our, we've got our shelf here. We're on this monorail. We need to get it into the rifle. What do we do next? Yes. Well, at this point, we transfer it to a hoist which will go out into the uh, handling room. Okay. Which is why we have the two pad eyes in the first place. Sure, now there's a, there's a gap in this monorail. Is that normal it, or? It is normal. Okay. As you can see, it's built this way. Yes. So that you can actually close these doors and lock them in place. And then when you're actually going to be firing your guns, unlocked, opened up, the set piece goes. There's in, an extra piece, in, fantastic. In location and bolted in place. That, that sounds smart, all right, fantastic. So we've got, a, we've got a demonstration shell here. Uh, this must be the hoist. It is. And this is just, what, a chute that has a hook come down it, right? Effectively, yes. It is another uh, chain hoist, if you will. Uh, this one is automated. It does have an electric motor on that to uh, provide the lift for this 1,275-pound shell. Sure. And what we're going to do, again, is not go directly to the turret itself, but we're going to go up one level and so that we can again create a break in that pathway going up to the turret. Okay. Um, at this point, probably the best way to see where this is going to go and how we're going to maneuver it, if we could walk around to this other sure. quadrant. Absolutely. Sure. 
So we as can you see can up here. see, one level above that deck, you can see that there is another shell in the upper hoistway wow. that slanted back. And if you recall from turret number one, the hoistway up there was slanted back a little bit. Yeah, it was. That is that same hoistway right there. Wow. So you have more and more manpower every single second of being on this, maneuvering a small car worth of explosives, not only in powder form, but also in shell form, up these hoistways. Correct. Wow, and uh, Keith told us that we could fire one. We could fire these rifles once every forty-five seconds. That is the school book solution. Yes, that is amazing. I, I can't even imagine being able to load two cars in, in that fast. So doing that with what is almost primitive technology. I mean, it's all it's all men backs and then a little bit of electric power for the for the shells is just astounding. And it did this since World War I, basically, right? That is true, uh, that is true. Um, we certainly needed the electrical power uh, for the lift, but uh, with everything else considered, um, the Navy constructors anticipated there were gonna be failures in the electrical power grid uh, on board ships back then. So how were you going to accomplish your primary mission? Well, you're gonna have to be able to build it in such a form that the manpower on board the ship could actually handle that function. So you've got ways for men to actually pull these shells upward as well? Well, no, we need uh, the electrical <laughs> power for this. Uh, ultimately, if these couldn't do it, there would be another way of going about doing it. I see. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you again for all the information, Don. Uh, You're quite welcome. This was astounding to learn how much effort it took to just fire one of those rifles. And I know, especially in our game, that's sort of taken for granted because all you're doing is left clicking and it just goes. So <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, thank you again. You're quite welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. And thank you guys for watching. Uh, this has been Talking Ship. Good luck, fair seas, and we'll see you out there. Remember, everybody, Battleship Texas needs your help. Yes, come visit her or go to our website, battleshiptexas.org, battleshiptexas.org.